Hello and welcome to the lecture on supranationalism and devolution. My name is Leon Sultan. I'm an AP Human Geography teacher at Abraham Lincoln High School in San Francisco, California. So this lecture is going to explore the movements of supranationalism as well as centripetal and centrifugal forces and devolution or the um, viability of a state. So we're going to start by referencing an article that appeared in Slate. It was republished from Business Insider. And this article is about what you're would look like if all the separatist movements got their way. There's a link to it in the bottom um, right here, and um, I will throw a link into the comment section to this article. So this article appeared in 2014, and um, it accompanied a map, and this map shows us what Europe would look like if the map of Europe would look like redrawn with the borders reflecting if all of the current independence movements actually got their way and got independence and seceded from their the states that they're a part of. So we can see, based on this map, the United Kingdom would come apart with Scotland, Wales, and then uh, this area of Cornwall all receiving independence. Um, Northern Europe would split into many new states as well, even France, um, this area, region of uh, Breton in the far west of France would uh, become a new state. If we look towards um, Western Europe and Southern Europe, we can see many other states um, being formed, including Andalusia, the state for um, uh, between France and Spain. We have a lot of new states as well, including the Basque state. Um, Northern Italy, we have a lot of secession going on there, as well as the islands of Corsica and Sardinia. So we can see there are actually a lot of independence movements in Europe, and if all of these were actually to achieve independence, the map of Europe would have to be drastically redrawn, and you'd have a lot more states. So right now, these these um, independence movements have their own flags, and these would turn into actual state flags if these independence movements got their way. So all, of course, all of the states that they're a part of at this point are trying to retain them because states don't like to lose territories. So we're going to look at supranationalism in Europe and how that has increased cohesion uh, among the U European economies um, community, as well as how it can act as a encouragement to devolutionary forces. So the forces of supranationalism in Europe, the first part of this question deals with the definition. So first of all, define supranationalism and give three examples. So the basic definition for supranationalism is a venture involving three or more states involving formal political, economic, and or cultural cooperation to promote shared goals. The really basic bare bones definition is three or more states working together to achieve shared goals. Now give three examples is the next part of this question and we're going to do that by looking at the following map. The following map is from our text and we can see select supranational organizations and the select supranational organizations on this map are primarily economic agreements. So one of the central ones that we're going to look at here is the European Union, or also called the European Community. Um, but North America has its own supranational organization involving Canada, United States, and Mexico, and that's a trade agreement, and that's called NAFTA, or the North American Free Trade Agreement. That's been in the news a lot recently um, with President-elect Trump uh, speaking about NAFTA and saying that um, he would like to re write the rules of NAFTA or perhaps even withdraw from that free trade agreement. So additionally, there are other free trade agreements that um, involve other states around the world. Another example would be here in uh, Southeast Asia where we have the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Um, so a lot of Southeast Asian states working together to promote uh, regional trade. Now, of course, the biggest supranational organization in the world is the United Nations. So the United Nations really encompasses every state, every re internationally recognized state in the world. And um, it is not primarily an economic organization. It is primarily a, a political organization that seeks to um, promote some economic goals, but um, generally speaking, promoting political goals as well as promoting peace and stability in states around the world. So now we're going to focus in on the European Union or the European Community. So the European Community really got started with um, Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg. It was a three three member supranational organization and expanded out uh, by 1958. Um, there were several members, all located pretty much in the center of Europe, and then later um, the rest of Western Europe and part of Eastern Europe 
uh, joined up to uh, 2007. So we can see on this map as well that despite the fact that these are all European uh, Union member states that not all have adopted the euro. As a matter of fact, the United Kingdom still hasn't adopted the euro. And um, they are now, as of 2017, officially no longer part of the European Union. So this map should be updated because uh, Britain, Great Britain voted in the fall of 2016 to exit the European Union. This was called the Brexit vote. So this map actually isn't current. So United Kingdom joined the European Union in 1973 and exited in 2016-2017. So we're going to look at some of the effects of supranationalism in Europe, and some of these effects are pretty positive. So the first effect of supranationalism in Europe is it's created a much larger market and increased trade because there is less um, there are less tariffs, there are less restrictions, and now there is a common currency of the euro. So the one major um, positive for this is for southern European countries, for example, with Italy and Spain, they have excellent climates to grow grapes that they can use to create wine, <clears throat> whereas northern European countries like Germany, Norway, Sweden are not able to grow that based on their climate. So with the removal of trade restrictions, um, there's a lot more trade that can happen from south to north. Additionally, there's a greater international influence. The EU is much more powerful than any one of its member states, and by joining together, they can actually counterbalance larger, more populous, more powerful states and traditional powers, such as the United States, China, and Russia. With the open borders, um, of the European Union and all sharing the same passport, there's increased internal migration for jobs within the EU as well as increased tourism. So it's very easy to travel from one end of the EU all the way from Portugal um, over to Poland on one passport and you can get a job anywhere in between. So that has really fostered, um, this open borders has fostered increased immigration. Common policies uh, include environmental policies, agricultural policies, as well as military policies. So all of these have really increased the collaboration between states and, and form sort of a cohesiveness within the region. However, despite all these positive forces, supranationalism can also act as a devolutionary force within a state. So the question here is how can supranational act, new supranationalism act as a devolutionary force? So one way is with the rise of the EU, the allegiance to the individual state has decreased in some places in favor of a European identity. So the allegiance to the state may be not as great anymore in some areas because people have their own ethnic or regional identity and then they see themselves more as a part of Europe. So rather than being a part of, say, Spain or Belgium or France. So they see themselves as being more European, and then they have their own unique individual ethnic identity. With EU membership, independence and creation of new smaller states becomes a lot more realistic. So why is that? Because when you have EU membership, you have already a large um, economic infrastructure that you can rely on. So for example, you have, the, you have a currency in the euro that's already international, it's very strong, um, and you already have trade partners, you already have a passport, you have open borders. So if you were to secede or gain independence from a larger state and you became a new smaller state, you already have a, a good economic infrastructure um, to start out with, which would be much more difficult if you were trying to, say, produce your own currency, create your own passports, etc., etc., so with EU membership, independence, and creation of new smaller states becomes a lot more realistic, especially economically realistic. Okay, we're going to change topics now, and we're going to move forward to devolution. So this part of the lecture is called struggling with devolution or keeping it together. And this part of the lecture is all about centripetal and centrifugal forces, the threats to the viability of a state, and what governments can do in order to counter these threats. Because the definition of a government, by definition, the government of a state is going to want to keep that state together and maintain their territorial integrity as well as their territorial sovereignty. So first, a quick review, centripetal forces. And again, a reminder, centripetal forces are forces that pull a state together. Some examples of these are nationalism or pride, a shared identity, 
a democratic process, so free and fair elections, economic interdependence within the state, as well as equal prosperity, and of course things like the Olympics, which can increase the shared identity and play into nationalism and pride. The interesting thing about centripetal forces is some of these a government can control, but not all of these. The idea of a shared identity, while a government may want to control this, they don't always have control over how people see themselves. So on the flip side, forces that push a state apart and threaten a state's viability are centrifugal forces. So centrifugal forces, one of the most common is ethnic and religious conflict. When you have an ethnic conflict within a state, people no longer have allegiance to the state, and now their allegiance lies with their own ethnicity or their own religion. Regional, cultural, and linguistic differences can push a state apart, as well as geographic distance or isolation and economic inequality between two regions in a state, especially when you have a much more wealthy and developed region where the inhabitants feel that they are supporting unfairly uh, a poorer region or subsidizing a poorer region. An example of this would be in Italy, where the north has a lot of independence movements, uh, centrifugal forces pushing on it because they earn um, quite a bit more for the national economy than the south does. So which of these can a government control? Again, economics, government has some control over, but not full control over. Ethnic and religious conflict, while governments would like to be able to control these things, they are not always within the control of a government. So governments have a lot of work to do, and we all know that when centrifugal forces overwhelm centripetal forces, then what we get is called devolution, and that can lead to the breakup of a state. So we're going to look at how states keep it together or fall apart. Uh, an example of this would be lack of transportation infrastructure. So a lack of transportation infrastructure, and we can see here pictured a very re remote village. And we can see in the bottom left of this picture, there's a yellow building. So on the right-hand side are where people live. On the left-hand side is the only of presence of the government that we can see in the village. And that building is most likely a school. It perhaps could be a health outpost, but that's really the only official government presence in this remote village. So when we look at a village like this and we see that we have a lack of transportation infrastructure, we see that this village is completely disconnected from the government, from the state, from the state capital. So the people in this village probably aren't going to have a strong affiliation, a strong identity, a strong allegiance to the state because the state is really absent from their lives on a daily basis. So some examples of where this occurs, this is a, a very um, it's a very common issue here in uh, northwestern Pakistan. So we look at northwestern Pakistan in what's called the tribal areas, the federally administered tribal areas, as well as the northwest frontier province. So many of these areas have a lack of transportation infrastructure, and they are completely isolated from any kind of official government presence. So this acts as a centrifugal force because people no longer have a shared identity. They don't see themselves necessarily as Pakistani. They see themselves as belonging to a tribe, and their allegiance lies with their tribe, not with their nation state of Pakistan. What other states have this problem? So a lack of transportation in infrastructure can really act as a centrifugal force in a country like Pakistan with a lot of mountains. So other states that have this problem are states that have areas that are totally geographically isolated. And most commonly, we're thinking about regions with a lot of mountains as well as islands. So states that have a lot of islands, oftentimes that leads to geographical isolation. So another example of keeping it together or falling apart would be, of course, the former Yugoslavia. When we look at former Yugoslavia, we're looking at a very ethnically diverse place. So how can this act as a centrifugal force? Well, as we've seen in our case studies, the way ethnic diversity acts as a centrifugal force is if there is some tension between ethnic groups, then the allegiance or the identity really lies with the ethnicity over the allegiance to the state. So we saw this in the 1980s in Yugoslavia where the Yugoslav identity really 
um, became subsumed by these ethnic identities, like, for example, Serbian ethnic identity, Croatian ethnic identity, and then Bosnian Muslim ethnic identity as well. So these ethnic identities became paramount. They became more important than the identity um, of being aligned with the state. And eventually this led to the creation of six new states as the former Yugoslavia broke apart in the early 1990s. What other states have this problem? Well, we know because of superimposed boundaries in sub-Saharan Africa that a lot of states in sub-Saharan Africa suffer from this same problem. Another prime example of this would be the state of Nigeria. Okay, so we're going to move towards keeping it together and what states can actually do in order to combat some of these devolutionary pressures or centrifugal forces. So one thing a state has done, and there are three examples of this, is moving the state capital. And this is a term called forward capital. So moving a state capital from the coast to the interior. So for example, in the state of Brazil, the state capital was moved from Rio de Janeiro to Brasilia. Now Brasilia is in a pretty remote area of um, primarily in the Amazon basin. Um, and this was a very strategic move by the Brazilian government. So the question here is, how can this act as a centripetal force? So one thing it is, it is it increases economic development in a region that really had no economic development. Another way that this acts as a centripetal force is, it brings the presence of the state or the presence of the government closer to these remote regions that really felt no presence of the state prior. So some other examples of this are in the state of Nigeria. This is the same thing. They moved from the initial capital of Lagos, which was a um, the colonial capital as well, and they moved it inland to Abuja. So very similar to Brazil, they moved it from a coastal place um, to a place in the center that would be more central and um, would be able to access, uh, be accessible to people of regions all over the, the state. So the final example of this is in Pakistan, uh, which we discussed earlier as having a lot of um, remote mountainous regions. So the initial capital was again on the coast in a city called uh, Karachi, and the forward capital is all the way up here inland. And again, we can see that's a lot closer to the mountainous regions, and the, the new capital is called Islamabad. Okay, so finally keeping it on the subject of keeping it together or centripetal forces, forces that hold a state together, one of the main forces that acts to hold a state together is economic development. So we can see here a map of Japan, and we know Japan to be one of the strongest, most developed countries in the world, really a model of economic development. Um, and the question here is how does this act as a centripetal force? So the way that economic development acts as a centripetal force is it creates an interdependence on people throughout the state. So in different regions of Japan, they are interdependent on each other for trade, for business, etc. And when you have this kind of prosperity, then these differences become masked. Regional differences, ethnic and religious differences can become masked and um you can also develop the infrastructure of a state. So when a government develops the infrastructure because they have good economic development, then a lot of people see benefits as um, identifying as a citizen of that state. So finally, the last question is, what other states rely on this factor as a centripetal force? And we all know that in the United States, economic development plays a huge role in us seeing ourselves as Americans, um, as well as other prosperous uh, nation states, for example, with Canada as well. So this concludes our lecture on supranationalism and devolution. I hope it was informative. Again, my name is Leon Sultan, and I'm an AP Human Geography teacher at Abraham Lincoln High School in San Francisco, California. Thank you, and please subscribe to the channel.